Borag Thung, Earthlets, Earthlings, Aliens of all stripes, welcome to the next episode of the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host, as always, Molchar, and I'm joined once again by uh, my fellow droid, Steve. Uh, welcome back to the uh, 2000 AD Thrillcast, Steve. Um, you're, uh, uh, you've been talking to uh, some of the creators uh, behind one of our, 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 our newer thrills, where I'm going to be talking in this episode to so some creators from something slightly older. Um, so, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. I, I, I mean, how, how, how are you in your, your particular sub-basement of the, uh, of the nerve centre? Uh, not too bad, you know. Um, Fog's not allowing me to have the air conditioning on, which is which is which is fine, I suppose. Um, it's getting a bit dusty, a bit dirty around here, but um, I'm told he'll be sweeping up. Uh, he's going to send me a broom at some point, which is oh, nice. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, is, hopefully it'll have bristles on it. Well, well, we'll see. We'll see. I'm actually using my own hair or something, but it's a treat, you know. It's nice of him to to be looking after me like that. So I always appreciate when Fog is looking down on me nicely. Tharg the generous, Tharg the magnificent, Tharg the. Uh mischievous um you are uh on this episode talking to a couple of creators uh about uh like i said one, one of the newer thrills do you want to tell us a little bit about um what what's in uh what's in store for the for that chat yes so uh i've spoken to um david barnett and mike walters who are two thirds of the creative team on lowborn high which has been our uh, all ages take on the uh, the wizarding world of um uh, of schools um I um, had a really nice chat with both of them. Uh, really, really, uh, really great guys and really good to hear from them about um, all the things they've been putting into the series, which has been running uh, throughout uh, the last few years and is now being finally collected into a, uh, a trade in uh, in uh, at the end of April, uh, on the, uh, the 24th of April it's out. Uh, but really nice chat with them about all the stuff they've been putting into it, the, um, uh, the idea of a... Um, you know, a comprehensive school for for wizards who uh, don't have the privilege or the money to get into the uh, the, uh, the the posh schools, um, and yeah, just a really nice time with them. Yeah, the 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 working class Hogwarts, really, isn't it? That's uh, the yes, exactly. Where anything idea. can happen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, there's there's a a general kind of supernatural theme to this episode uh, because I'm I'm in my interview. Talking to uh, some of the uh, the 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 malicious minds behind Scream, which was the uh, relatively short lived horror comic from my PC in the nineteen uh, eighties, uh, and um, I realised that I buried it just here. But um, forty years of Scream, this mm. whopping great big hardcover, is um, coming out. Uh, in May, I believe, um, uh, towards the end of May. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the the slipcase edition for this is sold out, uh, which is uh, is rather wonderful. But uh, sorry if you missed out on that. But you should definitely get the um, uh, the standard edition because it's all the strips from Scream printed in order uh, as they appeared in uh, in the original comic. And so, I've got Simon Furman. Uh, and uh, Ian Rimmer, uh, who uh, were very heavily involved. Well, uh, very heavily involved. Of course, they were heavily involved. Ian was the editor, and uh, Simon was uh, was uh, the sub editor and writer. Um, and also, uh, we're joined by Darren Scott, who's the editor of SFX Magazine. Um, who uh, <laughs> you you you'll you'll see when you watch the interview, he's having like a Proustian kind of rush. Of memory, um, because uh, Scream was like his gateway, really, to uh, to 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 horror and to comics and to and, and to everything else. So um, that was rather wonderful. To uh, I got a message actually from him afterwards, just going, just going, I I didn't want that to end. Like just just hearing Ian and Simon talking about this comic was was fantastic. So um, yeah, uh, that's 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 really enjoyable. Um, I will say I, I, thanks again, as always, to uh, everyone who's said how great is the podcast is back our pleasure thank you for listening um we've got some fantastic uh interviews lined up over the uh of the coming weeks uh including uh our next episode which he says just looking at the um the planner on his wall uh will be uh, a long chat with dan abnett now we've had dan on the on the podcast before 
um, to talk about Brink and, and various other things. But I wanted to actually kind of sit him down and talk about his um, his wider career, not just in terms of comics. Because you know, I was um, I'm sure he'd be delighted to know reading his stuff when I was a kid um, on titles like. Um, uh, Galaxy Rangers and uh, all, all the kind of you know the Marvel UK stuff, um, but also uh, his work on on universities. That, that, I mean, he's very well known in the Warhammer 40k um, uh, world um, for for his. I mean, big thick novels. I, I think. I mean, you know, to, talking about how you could uh, kill a man with a, a book like this. I, th- I, I think I saw a photo of a one of Dan's Warhammer books, which is like. It's like a loaf. It's the thickness of a loaf of bread. It's absolutely <laughs> incredible. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we may as well go from the preamble um, to the amble. So um, we're going to uh, hear from uh, Steve and David Barnett and Mike Walters uh, about uh, uh, the, the 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 comprehensive uh, <laughs> uh, magical school, uh, Lowborn High. All right, fun everyone. Uh, this is uh, Droid ST33V, otherwise known as Steve. Uh, I am joining you on the podcast today uh, for an interview with um, two of the uh, talents behind our uh, magical series, Lowborn High, which has been running in the prog for a, uh, a, a year or two now and will be collected into its uh, very first trade edition uh, in April. Uh, I have the writer of the series, David Barnett. Hi, David. How are Hello. you? Hello. Hi, I'm great. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. And I have one of the uh, two artists on the series, uh, Mike Walters. Mike, how are yourself? I'm good, mate. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you both for joining us on the uh, on the show today. It's great to have you both here. Now, uh, I suppose the, uh, the 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 big question we should be asking is. Um, uh, with low born high, it's uh, it's not often we get a, uh, a a magical school series in the in the prog. Uh, how did it come together, um, David? What was the initial pitch for this one? Um, this came about when, back when I first started uh, trying to get something for two thousand AD, and I was uh, pitching uh, Tharg with a, a number of ideas. And it was in the um, I think it was in the very early days of regined or it it had started but it may have just been um may have just had one or two issues out so uh Tharg was telling me about the um about the all ages uh kind of uh, ethos of of regined and he said uh come up with a couple of ideas for me using um existing characters and perhaps if you've got anything original that uh that, that comes out of it we can discuss that um the, the actual first work that I did for 2000 AD was actually Chopper, uh, the regened uh, version of uh, Chopper from uh, the Judge Dredd stories. But the actual uh, first commission like, was Lowborn High, and it was a uh, it was basically a one line pitch, which was uh, kind of I'm not even sure sure allowed like to say this the words, but it was kind of Harry Potter but working class was basically the pitch, and. and Yeah, uh, Grange Hill, and um, and that kind of TV, which for younger listeners was a um, very popular TV series set in a school, a very kind of like working class comprehensive in London. Um, that was throughout the seventies and eighties. So I kind of grew up on that, and basically, I I just always thought, um, with regards to the dark academia movement as it's called these days or uh, just basically magical school type stories they were always set in big castles and boarding schools and um, never really kind of spoke to my experience of being at school which was much more like Grange Hill where you got your dinner money nicked by the bully and um, the teachers were uh, couldn't wait to get down, down to the pub at lunchtime um, right. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I mean, for me, I I kind of read s- stories as a kid, boarding schools, but I didn't really understand them because it was so far from my experience. And I think for for a, quite a long time when I was really young, 
I thought a boarding school was somewhere you got you got sent to uh, as a punishment. I think I was confusing it with a ball stall, really, but uh, mm. it, <laughs> so it didn't really um, sort of speak to my experience. So I really wanted to write basically a story like, yeah, all, all these magical kids very often go off a posh school to study their craft, but what, what about the ones who kind of like aren't rich enough or the dads don't know the right people or they're not well-connected enough where do they go and, and what happens to them? So that was basically the impetus for Lowborn High. And this has been the backbone of 2000 AD since the start, has been the story of the working class hero. You know, we've... Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's always been it's always been a core part of what we're doing is, you know, we don't want to be telling the stories about the, um, you know, the I suppose the privileged people who are at the top of the chain and get everything handed to them. What's the interest in that? When we can hear the stories of people who've actually had to work for the living, you know, have had to prove themselves and find, you know, something, something, uh, something from themselves. Um, but that's I suppose the dynamic that makes Lobot High so interesting itself because your hero is not actually, he's not actually part of that world. He is a, he's not meant to be at Lobot High, is he? Yeah, absolutely. We've got Androgeus Frost, who's like one of the main characters, and. Uh, he was kind of uh, the link between what we know of this genre, which is basically the fairly posh kids getting uh, getting a, a magical education, but because he um, because he basically just rested on his laurels and uh, thought his name would get him through, uh, he gets kicked out of the posh school, which does manner. And has to go and prove himself for a year at uh, Lowborn. So he is he is the kind of link for people who may be more um, aware and who recognise that kind of genre to sort of um, make a, make the bridge between that and what's going on at Lowborn High, which is um, basically normal kids who uh, just uh, are, are as talented and have as much ability as the posh kids, but. Um, not the money or the uh, or the connections, so he gets thrust into that world. So we kind of see it through his eyes initially. Yeah, and um, uh, uh, both of you, do you want to tell us a bit more about the other characters who are who who he kind of like finds himself with? Because when he gets, you know, um, he gets the news that he's not going to go into uh, Witch Dusk Manor, the uh, the 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 fancy school he was meant to be in. He ends up in Lowborn High and clashes with a bunch of the uh, the kids who are already there because of his privileged manner. Um, who are the other kids who are, are around him and in the uh, in the series? And who are the, the characters you were most drawn to as you were writing and or drawing them? I, th- I think Mike could uh, take this in 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 terms of um, <clears throat> what 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 he liked about the the other characters in terms of uh, illustrating really initially. Um, well, from, from my point of view, like um. I, I did like Androgeus. I never know how you pronounce his name. I, I read it the first time. I was like, no, neither do I. I just, I just made it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Andy. Um, yeah, Andy. It was called Andy. Um, he was fun to draw, and I, I kept giving him different hair every episode for some reason. <laughs> um, and then it was the same with, I, I like Drill a lot, especially being that she, you know, she's like him. Um, and so that was fun in the third episode that I did. Um, with the polar bear, which everyone seemed to like, and everyone said, "Is it Shaco?" I don't know why, but, <laughs> <laughs> but everyone long. on mine was saying, "Is it Shaco?" But um, but yeah, so she was fun. Um, as an overall character, I really like drawing Maisie a lot. Um, mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of drawing wheelchairs. I won't, I won't lie to you there; they are a bit of a pain in the ass. A bit like imagine. cars, a bit like horses. <laughs> one of the things that people list it's one of those things that's tricky to do. Well, you just show up on the knees up and it's all right. <laughs> sure. And then you just sat down. Um, but no, she was fun and I think she had a lot of character. Um, but one thing I will say, don't look at my first episode. I hate it. <laughs> like, really? I hate the artwork. But the, the artwork that I turned in on that, I hate it. Um, just because it got offered to me um, fairly last minute. I just got an email from Matt saying, um, you know, Anna can't do it. Can you do it? And I'd done one future shock at that point. That was it. It was like four pages up to twenty pages, like out of the blue. That was a bit um, of a ba- baptism of fire, then, really. Just a bit, yeah. Welcome um, to two thousand AD. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, 
But no, the thing with that was um, one, the deadline, and two, I was just nervous. I didn't know how to approach it because my artwork is different than Anna's. So mm. in the back of my head, I was thinking, do I try and sort of ape her style or do I do my own thing? Um, by the second episode, I just thought, do your own thing. Don't try to change it or anything like that. Um, but yeah, they're all, they're all fun to be honest. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The um, th- there's kind of like the first person Andy meets in uh, in Lobon High is is basically the school bully. He's called mm-hmm. Zach, who thinks right, I'm gonna have him. He's rich. He's well connected. He's he can be in my gang, but um, Andy eventually falls in with basically the. The outsiders and the losers, um, which, as Mike said, that uh, there's Maisie, um, Ali, and Drill, and they, um, they, they kind of form the backbone really of uh, of, of the stories in terms of uh, and Andy gets um, incorporated into their group and um, raises the ire of the bully Zach. The Gripper Stebson character um in the process. So that makes for an ongoing uh, ongoing situation there. Yeah, the uh the uh, the Deadbeats Club, I think they call themselves, don't they? That's right, yeah. 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 So. yeah. Uh, and as the series goes on, as as uh, Mike mentioned, the uh, the characters all we get a bit of background on each of them. You get to have a dip into what's uh, what brought them to the school and uh, what the circumstances were behind it. And uh, I'm just interested in, in asking you uh, uh, both about this, but, you know, as you see the characters uh, develop, were there any that kind of surprised you and what happened with them? Like any characters you thought, oh, this character is going to go in this direction. And then suddenly things started changing and shifting. You thought, well, actually, this is what's going to happen now. And it just kind of caught you off guard. Um, um, the first one was... Um, to try out for the story really so you've got to sort of write a an episode that is a story that's self-contained but could carry on it may have been that um, everybody hated it so much that um they, they flooded 2000 eddie with letters and emails and said please don't give us any more of this um so it would have ended there so it had to be a self-contained story but we've got a second episode um so that again had to be a self-contained story because I didn't know how it was going to go and then after that, um, got the call saying, right, this we want a full series of this and um, want 20 page episodes, which is quite unusual for 2000 AD. Mm-hmm. And um, it uh, it allowed, allowed us then to tell a full story and sort of take the seeds that had been planted in the first couple of episodes and really draw them out. So one thing I wanted to do was um, make each episode kind of a focus on one character, tell their backstory as part of as, as part of the story that was happening in that episode. And um it goes it goes a chance to sort of like focus on each character and look at them and their 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 lives and and, and what they were doing, which I think uh, I think worked out all right really. It uh, allowed us to tell the full story as well against the ongoing um narrative. And it let you really explore the the, the magical world of this as well, because you know we are used to perhaps you know the uh, the stories of our Harry Potter, which is one of the main mm. comparisons I've had for this. Um, but it's interesting the ways that you work away from that or work with people's ex- expectations. You know, you you bring in uh, all all this stuff like you know, there's the um, uh, the magical sport they all play, um, uh, which is called Orbitus. Um, yes. There is uh, <laughs> there are the various monsters and the various uh, supernatural creatures that show up throughout the uh, series as it goes on, who uh, don't always have the um, uh, the agenda you might think they do, which is quite interesting. Um, were there um, like when you're building up a story like this, um, and, and Mike, I'll come to you, you first. Um, when you get the chance to work in a world where anything is possible, what were the kind of the the parts that you most enjoyed getting to 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 do or add into the world of Low Bon High? Um, well, for me, it would to be honest, it's probably like the monsters sort of side of it. Um, like in the first episode I did, we had the um, they called Trogs, the little sort of mm. lizard guys. Uh, they were fun to draw. Um, just I, don't know, I I got to just play with it a little bit um and then second episode i had that gin demon thing which 
as soon as I read the script, I was sat in bed on my iPad reading the script, and I thought, I'm going to enjoy that page. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it turned out all right. But um, And that gin in particular is a very, very striking design when it comes onto the page. Like, that was... That was that amazing, was yeah. That was designed on the page. I didn't do any sketches for it. Mm. Like um, <laughs> I just, I just kept going back and back and forward. I knew I wanted there to be like a skull involved, but that was about it. And then, um, I don't know. I just, I just kept playing with it till till I landed on something. And then I realised I had to draw it again. Um, <laughs> which so I had to keep looking back at it. But um, but yeah. So for me, to be honest, it was probably the monsters um sort of side of it. Yeah. Um. I, I did like the fight at the end of um the third episode that was from where they end up fighting um I'm not gonna say just in case spoilers, but yeah. <laughs> the, the baddie. Shall we it, say? All, yeah, it all it yeah. all it ramps up though, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I, I think um I think from a writing point of view, it's um it it's so in when I'm writing a script, you you try to visualize what it's gonna look like on the page. Um but you never really get it until you see the artwork come back and you go, right, yeah, that looks brilliant. That's exactly what I meant. So I'm glad um, I managed to get that across uh, in the script. But it also shows you the strengths of the artists you're working with. And uh, first with Anna and then Mike, it's like, right, okay, yeah, that's brilliant. The great at that. Let's put more of that in the next episode and uh, and so on. So, so it is totally uh, a collaborative and organic thing really you see you see how how the artist is working and what they can do and that informs the writing of the next script really and we should um give a uh, shout out to anna who uh, anna morozova who uh drew the uh the, the first half of low born high essentially <laughs> the uh, the first few stories and was uh responsible for quite a lot of the design of the world and the characters and does a, a an amazing distinctive job of it all oh ab- absolutely yeah it was um it uh, I'd, I'd written the first couple of scripts and I didn't know who was going to be uh, doing the artwork. And then um, Anna was brought on board initially and uh, I think she did an amazing job. It was, the style and the tone of, of it was exactly spot on. And that did um, inform how I was going to write the uh, the following episodes. And then um, Mike came in when Anna had to, uh, had to pull out after the first couple of episodes, um, the first about like, three and then, um, despite what he says, I think it was quite a seamless move, really, because it uh, the styles were slightly different, but um, Mike pick, picked up the kind of tone of it, and it's obviously recognisable as the same world and the same story, uh, with just uh, a slightly different artistic take on it. But I think it the continuity that runs through uh, is just perfect, I think. Yeah, the characters are distinctly themselves the entire time, you know, especially when you get to the um, one of the final episodes. We won't spoil what happens at the end or anything, but um, part of it is set at the uh, the, the prom and uh, they all get dressed up in their their finest outfits. And the, mm. um, the choice of each of the outfits that they're all wearing, I think, really speaks to their characters. Um, and that must be, uh, you know, uh, obviously work together on that. But um, uh, Mike, when you're doing that, you know, you have the... Um, uh, the edict is that they all have to be dressed in uh, in in white, and half of them don't pay attention to that whatsoever, which really plays into their characters. I think. Um, but you know, by yeah. that point, we're feeling pretty comfortable with the characters. You thought, let's let's experiment around, let's play with things a bit. Um, yeah, by that point, I was I was pretty happy with. I mean, to be honest, by the time I was starting the second episode, I kind of knew how I was drawing them. Mm-hmm. Like it, it takes me a few pages to kind of suss out. You know how they move and how they act and all this stuff. Um, I, I enjoyed the the prom bit or the ball, whatever you want to call it. Um, I enjoyed drawing that a lot. Um, and I think you know, shout out to Pepper Ball and the uh, the colorist. Oh, absolutely! It just yeah. really brought that to life. Um, so it it looked all right when I drew it, but then when I got the colors back, and I just thought, yeah, I like that. Um, it had like a nice sort of blue tint to it, which really. Mm. Yeah, it's spot on. Um, and then I was gonna say, f- funny little story about that scene actually. When Maisie does something again, no spoilers, but she <laughs> does something, and there's a there's a reaction from Andy, 
Um, so one of the panels there is a, it's a nod to the classic um, Spider-Man panel, the first appearance of Mary Jane. And funnily enough, I drew that the night before John Romita died. I thought that was really? a really weird yeah. coincidence. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've always been a fan of his work, and I thought that's a perfect place to put a little nod in. Yeah, yeah. it was a lovely homage, definitely. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's just a shame that it came with such timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. What a nice tribute, yeah. Um, and, and, and Mike, we should probably t- uh, talk a little bit about your history with um, 2000 AD and as, a, as an artist as well, because... Um, you didn't come perhaps from the uh, the usual route, did you, to 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 work for 2000 AD? What was your uh, intro into the galaxy's greatest? Um, I, I went to Thought Bubble in 2022 and did the um the art competition that they do every year. And um, just honestly, I went there thinking I'll I'll get some feedback and that'll you know drive me on to the next thing. Um, but then obviously saw Matt there. He went through my pages. Said, yeah, we'll put you through until tomorrow. So obviously, as soon as I'm out of the queue, I'm ringing everyone. I'm into the final. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, second day, um, got up and just somehow managed to win. And uh, the funny thing was, Anna was one of the um, one of the judges on the panel there. <laughs> so I thought it was ironic that I followed her on on this. Um, I actually was spoke to. I'm oh, sorry, go on. Uh, well, there was part of me that wanted to message her and say, "Did you know? Did you have a hand in this or what?" Or... <laughs> but I, I don't know. But no. But yeah, well, that's how good. So she and, she, uh, and... she certainly approved of it because I uh, I saw her the football afterwards in twenty twenty three, and uh, that was one of the first things she mentioned. She said last year he was you know he was on the on the panel as a uh, submitting to us, and this year he's working for two thousand AD. It's kind of a great. It's great yeah. to see that. I suppose is to see the chance that there's there's an opportunity to to you know uh, to to come and join two thousand eighty and work for us. You know, um, and uh, have the opportunity. Well, that that's the thing that I never um, expected. Um, you know, I, I got the first future shock, and I thought that'll probably be it for a little bit. But it's it's okay. I'm in two thousand AD, and you know, big two thousand AD fan. I read it every week and all that. Um, I just thought, you know, I can I can run around and say I've been in it, but then, mm. you know, I've, I've been in multiples now. I'm working on another story, which I'm not sure if it's in the magazine or if it's in 2080 itself. But either way, I'm still working for him, which is, you know, every time I get an, an email through from Matt saying, "Do you want to work on this?" Before I even read what it is, I'm like, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I do." <laughs> But um, yeah. So it, it's it, it's um, well, it's a privilege, isn't it? Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, again, it's kind of um, like it's talked about. You know, the um, the the working class ethos of um, you know, you put the work in and you get there, and it's quite nice that that is actually the way that people get into two thousand AD. You know, as creators as well, it's not just something that we tell the stories of. It is a part of our actual process. You know, it's, it's part of our. Um, structure as a uh, as a publisher, which is uh, something that hopefully will continue for a uh, a, a long time. Um, David, um, for your, for yourself, um, mm. you've um, written a few different two thousand AD stories now, and as you mentioned, low bond high is a different kind of structure, different kind of format, being twenty mm. pages at a time, which is not something that you would normally get in two thousand AD. With that, and with the um, the fact it's all ages, which again might not be a natural instinct when you're writing mm. 2000 AD, um, how difficult was it to get into writing low on high? Was it something that, that kind of started coming naturally, or did it have to work over time, or how was it for you? It um, it was kind of um, it it was a different uh, it was a different process really from what I'd written previously which had been very much kind of uh adult orientated stuff um uh for other publishers but i think it was just a case of like getting into the mindset and thinking right okay um this is the tone of the story and and i, I think um all ages is um it's quite an interesting sort of categorization of stories because it is actually true it's it, it's you're trying to write something that you know, you know, someone in the twenties 
is going to be happy to read someone in the 30s, someone older, someone my age. So it's um, it's what might have been once called kids comics or stories for younger readers. You think, well, you know, they deserve a proper story and a proper narrative and as mm-hmm. as deeply layered a story as you would write for an adult. So it's just a case of um, writing, not writing down to people, but also bearing in mind the audience so there's not going to be a lot of effing and blinding and sex and nastiness going on um, too much. But uh, I think what, once, for me, once I got into the kind of mindset of it, it all, uh, the, the tone and the story kind of uh, flowed from there, really. So it uh, it was just a case of sitting down and thinking, what am I writing today, low on high, right? And then get getting into the zone, really. Mm-hmm. It is also not hand holding, which I think is a really important part of the series. As you as you mentioned, it's not treating children with um you know uh, kiddie gloves, I suppose, um any of that sort of stuff. It it has got you know um uh, mature themes in it that are, you know mm. as people are in that stage of life where they are developing and growing as people and discovering who they are, um and that's not something that you've you know shied away from at all. Um, uh, interesting. There, there are a number of different relationships teased in the uh, in the book. We won't say uh, anything that's going to go on. Um, but um, when you were writing it, were you, you know, was it interesting in pushing that and going, let's let's make sure that we are doing something that isn't just you know for very young readers. This is something that yeah. is going to have stuff that speaks to people who are you know uh, growing in that age themselves and you know are, are looking for kind of like I suppose a bit of understanding of what the world's like. Yeah, absolutely. It's um and I, th- I think that's where the uh, the later 20 page format came into its own which, which allowed us to sort of explore stories where you and 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 more character uh points than you you'd get if you're doing a six or eight page episode. Um it it allowed that story uh space to breathe and those individual stories and yeah, it's um it's it's a difficult one. The all ages thing. It's like I mean, what are the ages? What what's the minimum? Who exactly is this going to be pitched at? And you're thinking, well, this is almost more young adult than kind of like you know monster fun or phoenix type level of um of of age reading. So uh, yeah, I th- I, th- I thought it was important. I mean, I mean, harking back to what I said right at the beginning, like uh, shows like Grange Hill never shied that they were on a tea time it was it was aimed at kids but it never shied from uh difficult subjects um you only need to say just say no and everyone knows what that's all about uh mm-hmm. it, it it um it tackled you know sort of like really serious hard drug abuse there were sexual issues there was all the stuff that people navigate growing up as a as a young teen um i thought it was a fair game to put in and it, and it is just that hitting that right tone and talking about stuff without um, it, treading that fine line without sort of like hitting people over the head with it and also being a bit too obtuse. So you've got to kind of um, just uh, navigate that story and not treat your reader like an idiot, but also not be too far above the head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Um, with uh Lobo High out uh later uh this this month, uh, it is I believe currently April, Fargo allowing, uh, and uh, the uh, the collections could be out on the uh the the twenty fourth of April. Um, what would you say to anyone who's thinking of picking up but hasn't uh read it in the uh, in the prog? What would you be your kind of like your your pitch for it? Um, f- for me, I think um. It hangs together really well as a self-contained story, but part of a wider narrative. Um, hopefully, it, its episodic nature, as it appeared in the uh, in in the comic, uh, will seamlessly run into one story. And I think it's it's a story for anyone who likes magic and stories about young people, and also with a dose of. Um, kind of social commentary and and realism i mean we're not talking kez here or anything like that but i think for anyone who, who basically who enjoys harry potter but always wondered if they would fit in this is the place that you would fit in so i think maybe you want to read about it very nice um 
And uh, I have uh, one last question as time is uh, ticking away from us, uh, which is to say, uh, yeah, Mike and Dave, you both mentioned this earlier, um, you've alluded to it, uh, you have other work coming up in uh, the Galaxy's Greatest Comic, I believe. Um, what can you what can you currently tease us about what you are working on, which uh, won't get Farg angry? <laughs> um, <laughs> Mike, just um, part of his hell. Um, well, I've I've got a feature shop um, that I completed in October, I think, and that's just been sat for a minute. Um, I think it's I think he said it's out in May, but I'm not. I don't, I don't want to bug him too much and be like, "When's it out? When's it out?" <laughs> um, we'll have a word. And then, yeah. and then, um, I don't know if I should say what the other one is, but <laughs> it's, um, just purely because. It's not been in the prog for a while, and I don't want to spoil it coming let's, back. Let's say, um, let's say generally, what kind of a series is it? Is it a, uh, uh, you know, it's probably science fiction. Is it yes. horror, thriller, action, all of them? Uh, I'd, I'd call it like science fiction, action kind of thing. Um, I'll say it's in Dreadworld. Uh, that's as far as I'll go. Um, okay. But it's it's a lot of fun. I've been having an absolute blast on it. Um, but, Doug, if you want to do more Love on High, I won't say no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, because I, re- I did really enjoy drawing it, and, you know, I, I hope it does continue, because when I got to the end of the last script, um, I, I even emailed Matt and said, well, are we getting more? What's going on? Because <laughs> it, it, it said Love on High will return, and I was like, well, will it? Like, I, I've not heard nothing, but I'm, I'm hoping it does. Who knows how uh, Farg's mind works, but he always comes around to things in the end. I find. Um, thank you for for that, Mike. Uh, uh, David, uh, how about your uh, how about yourself? Yeah, I think I've got. Uh, I think there are two uh, series waiting to drop in two thousand eighty. Um, one is a return of some characters we've seen before, um, a certain talking dog and uh, a yeah. uh, magician uh, from Manchester who uh, have made two appearances and I'm delighted to say I've got a a much longer run hopefully coming up, which again, in the same way that uh, Low Bon High started off as a couple of self-contained stories and then uh, allowed me to to tell a a much longer story. This is exactly the same and it tells the story I really wanted to tell about these two. So that's coming up soon. And I've just delivered some scripts for um, a new project which I um, will be, all I can say at the moment is Space Pirates. Okay. That's the only two words that you need to say, I think. It, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's an absolute bonkers, uh, bonkers new series with original characters, but Space Pirates, definitely. Something to, uh, to, to look forward to. Um, well, um, with all that in mind, thank you both for uh, coming on to the uh, the, the Frillcast today. Uh, the only other question I suppose I should ask is, uh, where can people find you? If they want to find you online, whereabouts are you active at the moment? Um, David, yourself? Oh, um, probably on Twitter, although I'm a bit, uh, or X as we call it. Or, uh, so I'm at David M. Barnett, um, which I am on most social media and I'm, it very much depends what mood I'm in with from on there not these days. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, gen- generally um Twitter X is the best starting point should anyone want want me. Right. And uh, Mike yourself? Um mine is just at Mike Walters or uh, no, sorry, at Mike Walters underscore R on basically everything. Twitter, Instagram. I refuse to call it X, it's Twitter. Um <laughs> and I, mean, I do have a TikTok account. I do upload on there every now and then, but yeah. <laughs> um, best place is probably Instagram or Twitter, to be honest. Brilliant. Sure. Well, thank you both very much for coming on to the uh, uh, the Thrillcast. Uh, it's uh, really appreciated. And uh, we should say one more time, Low on High is uh, out from 2000 AD on April the 24th, 2024. Don't miss our turflets. Well, uh, wonderful. 
Um, thank you to David and to Mike for that. I mean, Steve, is is there a kind of takeaway from from that interview about about lowborn high that uh, that kind of stuck out for you? The, the thing that really um, that, that came out from talking to, to the guys was the 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 continuation of the uh, the working class story, which has always been a part of 2000 AD. Mm. Um, they talked about you know um, Grange Hill being one of the main uh, points of reference when they were when they were putting this together, and the you know, the classic stories never shied away from talking about um, class society, talking about actual issues that mattered to kids. Mm. You know, it wasn't a case of speaking down to them or, or or doing things that seemed a bit you know silly or whatever. It was honest, truthful uh, storytelling, which is what they tried to put into mm. Low Bon High, and it's nice to see that. 2008 has always had a long tradition of working class heroes and working class stories, and Loban High is just the latest addition to that continuing theme. Mm. I, I mean, in the future, will we see Loban High's version of Zamo, uh, <laughs> where then all of his classmates get together to record record a, a charity single? We can only hope. Um, <laughs> I mean, get your get your vocal cords going. Uh, we'll see if we can get us all all together in the uh, nerve center and uh, and sing along. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Um, wonderful. Well, I, I thank you very much for that. Um, our next uh, interview is with uh, Ian Rimmer, former editor of Scream, uh, Simon Furman, former uh, sub-editor and, and writer on Scream, and Darren Scott, who's the um, current editor of SFX magazine, where we're talking about um, the... I'm going to bring this up again because my arms need the workout. Uh, the 40 Years of Scream uh, book, uh, which, you know, I mean, you've got Alan Moore in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the on the beginning of Monster, where we bought out a collection of Monster a few years ago. Um, but you, John Wagner, Cam Kennedy, Steve Dillon, Jose Ortiz, like Gasly the, McNasty, of course. Say again, Gasly McNasty, of course, is always oh, Gasly McNasty. Yeah, um, uh, it's 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 really it's a bit like I mean, it's a bit like Misty, which of course was the the the, the earlier horror comic uh, for girls where. Even though they had relatively short runs, like obviously, you know, uh, 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 Misty eventually um, got cancelled, and um, Scream lasted what a year, eighteen months, or whatever it was. Um, the impact, like when when you get a comic yeah. at a, at the right age, and it's very, you know, you you might not even realise that you're into horror as a kid, and 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 Scott just kind of um, uh, pick up on this a little bit. Um, the the sheer impact these comics have on you for the rest of your life is, I mean, it's a hell of a thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I I I do I wonder if uh, uh, you know there's there's any youngsters reading Lowborn High who are gonna <laughs> have yeah, a, the, a uh, lifelong obsession the uh, with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful. So uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll 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 hear from them. But um, uh, thank you very much, Steve, and to uh, uh, David and Mike and Ian and um, Simon and Scott. Um, and thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, I will leave you in the hands of well, my other self doing the interview. Um, but we shall see you in two weeks' time, Earthlets, when we'll be talking to uh, writer Dan Abnett. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. We'll see you then. And as always. From me and Steve and everyone at the 2018 Nerve Center, Splendid Verthrig. All right, uh, to discuss uh, the the uh, the history and the legacy of Scream, I'm joined by uh, three excellent guests on this little panel discussion. Um, first off is uh, Simon Furman, uh, writer, editor, man about town, um, who, who many people I'm sure will, will know from his work on uh, on the Transformers uh, comics. Uh, I'm also joined by uh, Ian Rimmer, who was editor on Scream during its uh, a brief brief existence in the firmament, and uh, Darren Scott, the editor of SFX, who's somebody who's, who's been profoundly affected by uh, by being uh, having the bejesus scared out, out of him when he was a child. So, thanks so much for for uh, agreeing to uh, to come on here and chat about Scream. This is this this is what we're talking about. This this hefty so and so, uh, which is the oh, it is uh, big, isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's the, the the forty years of Scream, the archival collection, which is um, all of the strips in order as they appeared. Um, so one episode of the Dracula Files, one episode of Monster, so on and so forth, uh, all the way through. And um, uh, kind of 
for those of you watching on uh, this on YouTube, this will be fascinating. But for, for those of you listening to the podcast, uh, <laughs> even also, um, <laughs> but some beautifully cleaned up um, black and white uh, pages. I think I flicked onto early Steve Dillon um, and early Simon Furman. Yeah, very yes, early. exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so absolutely gorgeous one. The um, the 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 slipcase edition. That we did sold out before it was out. Wow! Wow! To give you an idea how that's gone, um, so yeah, it's just the uh, the standard uh, edition that's uh, available. But it, it for a comic that only lasted fifteen issues in nineteen eighty four, the story of Scream I think is actually uh, a forgotten kind of key moment in the history of comics and um it's a delight to, to, to be able to talk to you about it I, I i want to come to ian first as the person who's probably had the most <laughs> involvement with <Scream. laughs> um tell us a little bit about how you came to be uh involved in the whole project uh okay well i i was uh working at ipc magazines i first went there as a photo story writer on uh, girls' teenage fiction um, on a title called Photo Love. Uh, when uh, Eagle was relaunched they, in 1982, I think, uh, they had photo stories in, in Eagle. So they wanted people with so, some photo story experience. And that's when I kind of made the shift across from, from the girls' uh, fiction side to the what we might term boys' adventure. Um, uh, and then a couple of years after that, I think it was, uh, I got a call on a Friday afternoon to go down and see one of the managing directors. Uh, uh, and he um, gave me the dummy of Scream and said I was in in line to, to become the editor on this title. Take away the dummy, have a look at it over the weekend and tell us what you think. And that was my involvement in it at, at that point. At that at that stage, on the dummy stage, the the, the uh, publication I was given, it, effectively that was pretty much close to the first issue of Scream in the sense that all the major stories uh, were all there in in that. The the only uh, sort of troublesome part of it was they there was an insistence that there should be some element of humour uh, in into this and and straight humour as opposed to the humour that. Uh, the sort of dark humour that that I thought should be permeating all the script. Uh, they wanted some some sort of overt, straight um, monsters type humour, shall we say, or Adam's family type humour. Uh, if only we could get it that good, that would have been handy. Um, but um, that's uh, that's more or less what, how I came on board, and that was that's another story about how we tried to develop the, the humour side of things, and, and we'll go on to that perhaps later on. But, that's that was how I came on board, and that's where it was. This is like, this is something that that, that Barry Tomlinson, um, who uh, had, had so much involvement um, as a group editor in well everything really. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he was putting out yes. the times that you know Roy the Rovers, Eagle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This this, yep. this was something that that that, he, that he'd put together. I, I mean, what what was your your um, impression uh, of 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 that first dummy, I mean, was, was was it something that you were surprised it was so um, complete um, at, at the beginning, or, or, or was that fairly standard for a new IPC title? Uh, I, I was surprised at uh, how sort of complete it was. I mean, and, it, and looking back on it, when I think about it, it must have been some time in preparation. And I think we, we've we've subsequently learned that that was the case. That I think it was Barry and I think Gil Page had long wanted to produce a, a, a title for, in quotes, horror uh, market, if you would. Um, that, that they'd been working on these that, something along those lines for some time, for a good few years. I think um, there was a, a title called Blackjack, I think, that Gil was heavily involved in from way, way back. So they always knew there was, a, the, these guys always knew there was a market for, for this title and a gap in the market that could be filled. It was a question of how they were going to attempt it. Uh, uh, and if the people who were above them would uh, would wear publishing a, 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 what would, again, to use the air quotes, the horror title, um, given the, the issue that had happened with, I think it was called Action, and a few years earlier than that, that had to be pulled and 
uh, for being overly violent. So there was there was a, an awareness that uh, they couldn't just publish anything and get away with it. There had to be ground, uh, sort of ground rules and things. So what what they what they what I saw at that dummy stage uh, was pretty much as I, as I was saying, it was pretty much close to the original scream, and it seemed to have covered an awful lot of different aspects of of the horror world. We we had the futuristic science, uh, futuristic horror in in thirteenth uh, floor. We had the kind of monstery um, horror, Frankenstein, if you like, in in monster itself. We had the classic Dracula. We had the kind of um, gaslight ghoulishness, if you if you want, for uh, Tales from the Grave. So there was the, there was a sweep across there, and I suppose we could we could even say the the terror of the cat was a. Uh, Hitchcock's uh, The Birds, or, or Daphne du Maurier's The Birds, as we, as we, <laughs> as we now know. Um, so uh, there was a kind of a, a whole sweep of the, of the horror field, if you like, uh, <laughs> except this humour bit that nobody could ever get right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that was my impression when I saw it. I thought this, this covers a, a quite, quite an area of, you know, not, not, it's not just fixed into one, it's not just fixed in classical Dracula, it's not just fixed in um ghoulishness it's it's kind of going across a sweep of of storylines that um maybe has some kind of uh, clue as to why it, it had such an appeal when it first in, uh, came home came out the the ipc archive um which is now the rebellion archive um looking back on it it's it, it considering it's 130 years of, of publishing history, uh, c covering every genre you can possibly imagine. You know, it's been described as like British manga. Um, you know, mm. whatever, whatever you want is probably a, yeah. a comic strip based on it. Um, horror is is incredibly underrepresented. Do, do you have an idea as to why why that is? You know, why was um, why was horror just not something that British comics really did an awful lot of? I, I, I just guess that there was a there was a genuine fear of of the backlash that might come from it. Um, that was particularly the case where uh, on our time because we'd also had uh, just previous to 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 the launch that you'd have the video uh, video nasties dis, uh, discourse that had gone on and there were fears of producing a comic nasty would would always be there. Whether that was the case, you know, previously with with. Um, uh, through the history of publishing, I, I, I can't really hazard a guess, but that was certainly what was prevalent at the time. There was, uh, and in, in one sense, you know, you almost have to say that they were a little bit brave. If that was, they had those fears at the time, they were quite brave to actually put it out in the first place. <clears throat> I, I, I want to come to Darren because um, uh, Ian and Simon represent, you know, the people who made this thing. Mm. What was it like as a consumer of the thing? Um, you know, we, we, and were you there from kind of issue one with the? Was was it the little Dracula fangs on the front? Dracula fangs, yeah, yeah, and then the spider in issue two. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was there from the start. I must. I was thinking about this the other day, and I must have seen the advertising in. I don't know. I'm guessing Buster or Whoopi or something like along those lines. Um, so I knew it was coming, and it was something that obviously like you said it was underrepresented and even i was eight, i was eight at the time seven or eight so um even then i kind of knew that that was something that i was into but there wasn't that much of a an outlet for it i guess you know and I, I read all the other comics and i was into superheroes to a degree um but hadn't really fallen into the whole the pit of it all and and it hadn't really grabbed me and scream was the first one that that's that changed everything really for me um so it changed my perspective on what comics could be and what they could achieve and um and that they didn't all have to be like uh you know buster whoopee wizard and chips whatever i mean obviously i i by that point i wasn't aware of things like misty or spellbound and that all came later and it was something that it, it just opened the floodgates for me to be able to fully embrace that kind of storytelling and um that kind of art and just I mean, I was I was obsessed with Scream comic as a kid. I was really upset. Like, I think I wrote to um, I wrote to uh, Ghastly McNasty a couple of times. <laughs> um, yeah, I so I mean, I can't tell you what a thrill it is to be sitting here talking to you guys. It's so so incredible. Um, and I, I still to this day say it's my favorite comic. Um, 
uh, and like you say it has that legacy which is you know you say it's surprising because it's 15 issues but um there's a generation that uh that know it and obviously with the fact that the book has sold out in the limited edition straight away tells you something i think um uh yeah and it it, it really has it really shifted my mindset as to what <laughs> could be achieved in print and how other things were possible which of course over a period of time has been something that as my career has become it's, it's largely part partly due to things like scream opening up my mind to the fact that it it, it it can be anything really and um and thankfully you guys did it and you went for that and um you know you saw it through it, it, it was interesting uh, what, what Ian was saying about the, the the breadth of stories in this so actually you have genres within the the the, the, the horror genre I get I, I guess as a kid that that must you kind of you're not necessarily thinking in terms of genre so it's just you know setting after setting after setting character after character but it, like I say, it opens your mind because you you see other kinds of stories, and you, you there are so many parts of Scream that have stuck with me. You know how people talk about classic horror movies they read, uh, they saw when they were growing up, and moments in film. That there's there's panels and storylines from Scream that have stuck with me as vividly as they would be a film. Um, and that's and also you have to think about the fact that I was, when I was actually growing up, I didn't at some point along the way. We were an RAF family, so we moved around the country quite a lot. And um, somewhere along the way, I lost those comics. So the memory I had, this obviously pre-internet, the memories I had of, of the comic were sticking with me through not having, there wasn't annuals. I mean, there was occasionally, there was a summer special or whatever, but, um, you know, it's it was very funny to be able to, I mean, obviously years ago to get another collection of the whole set of comics again. And to be able to just see how vivid to, how, how I remembered all of these things from such a young age that really stuck with me um, and had, like you say, you know, the fact Terror of the Cats is a different, totally different beast from 13th Floor. And yeah, it's it's kind of uh, the more you th the more you think about it, it is a really it's a really out there publication in terms, especially for the time as well. Uh, uh, Simon, I, I, I want to come to you. Um, how often did Ian make you write the dialogue for Gasty McNasty, and um, uh, how much did you come to to, to hate it? No, no, <laughs> no, there's very little of Scream I can remember hating at all. You know, I mean, yes, we had our problems. We had last minute rewrites of things all the time, but the actual essence of Scream was great from the start. Like I say, I came on board. A little bit after Ian, because I was just fulfilling that role of sub or assistant editor on the comic. But, um, you know, right away, I could see it just had so much potential, the comic. You know, it really was. Those, that first yeah. scripts, obviously some very talented creators involved in those. But they were such a good bedrock of the comic that right away, you know, you could see it was going to be a great fun thing to work on. And actually, Ghastly Monastic, I love the idea. And, you know, we, we followed this idea on of having the persona of an editor be part of the comic tapestry itself. You know, Ghastly Monastic was a great creation. It got the readers really involved in it, as I remember, because, you know, they had to draw what they thought he looked like under the cowl. You know, they, they we got straight away into that letter answering thing of, being able to answer letters in character that we took on into Transformers when we used to do the letter columns as one of the Transformers. So, you know, there, everything about Scream was almost the most brilliant building block experience for me of just, you know, how to really produce a, a comic and engage the readers with it. And I think that's that's really what the success of Scream is how much almost from the right off the bat it got readers you know we used to have sacks of mail that i do remember that you know there was a massive post bag that came into scream every week that largely i had to sort through and uh and you know pare down into some letters for the letters page but it, yeah i mean the you know this is the tragedy of scream really that it really did strike a chord it really did get readers engaged and excited and hopefully a little terrified as well. And, yeah, you know, the fact that 
it didn't get to kind of reach its full potential is the saddest thing of Scream for me. It's one of the interesting things about, I mean, all comics of this period, whether it's 2000 AD, Misty, Scream, um, uh, obviously, uh, uh, well, not obviously to those who don't know, but uh, Max, the um, uh, the murderous AI from uh, the 13th floor would go on to edit uh, Eagle um, uh, later on. And, it, it, and it's such a contrast because uh, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, Marvel comics, um in in sort of the, the 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 silver age and the bronze age very much focused although it was a fictitious relationship um a fictitious kind of world it focused on the creators you know stan lee used to talk about the bullpen and you know would talk about the different characters of the of the creators where british comics were very much focused on really fictional um uh, uh, um uh, editors <laughs> And you know, Farg the Mighty obviously is one that's um, that's somehow stood the test of time. <laughs> You'll kill me for saying that. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 Ian, it, uh, give us an idea of, of of what it's like putting together something like this, where where everything fits a theme. You've got to, you know, everything's got to play off each other. Is it is it a very intensive, or was it a very intensive? process or did it did things like that kind of come naturally was was that a bit of fun kind of like that simon's uh simon's employed yeah it was more the, the second is more the it was it was a fun element to to it, it, gave, it gave you a little bit of a disguise and a little bit of uh framework to to work around to, to how you were going to approach uh addressing the readers so you uh yes it was it was, it was always fun fun to work on uh fun to produce or imagine yourself as as being ghastly and how would ghastly answer this particular question or or what would be his response to to this uh to whatever suggestion was being made and sometimes he'd be a little caustic sometimes he'd be very enthusiastic um but it, yeah it, it gave a little bit of framework and structure a bit of a bit of skeleton to, to to then work 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 yourself around to, to write up whatever it was however um, whether whether it's uh, instructions on on the the fold out um, uh, uh, front uh, double page spread sort of covers that we did occasionally, it, it, it's it's just something something to hang your words on that you can um, uh, express whatever you want and and it and it should hopefully engage with the reader that they can identify with it too hopefully <laughs> maybe maybe. maybe. I'd forgotten how much engagement there was with the readers because when I look back at it, there were it wasn't just draw ghastly, it wasn't just letters. You could choose a celebrity to stick in ghastly's dungeon. You know, it, there there were so many ways. I think you know we just got the readers engaged and wanting to communicate with us. And you know, I think that's something I've taken on into other comics, other editing jobs. Is just you know if you pay attention to your readers and you get you know their attention you really will have a successful comic out of it so you know yeah i think scream was the perfect kind of proving ground for me did they also sorry to, to, can i just quickly ask with the journalist in me do, do, was that a, a sort of thing that rolled over into secret wars as well because they had a, a character that was living in the office at night i think and then people were encouraged to come to, to draw that and send that in as well i, I kind of guess it was it's, it's the same sort of ideas yes but uh, that it never it was never as as fully formed as it was with Gatsby, who, who was supposedly, you know, producing the whole thing in in the basement in uh, at uh, in the depths uh, at King Street. So it was never as fully formed as that. But I, I guess the 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 implication was, yeah, we were moving along in that in, in that limited way that we could with uh, with Secret Wars because so, so much of it is was was reprinting in, in American material. So it was a kind of a an attempt to move in that direction, but I don't think we ever fulfilled it properly. But you know, along, along those lines, certainly. Uh, this, this, this is where I um, asked Darren uh, how many uh, pictures of uh, Ghastly he submitted, and um, and what uh, what celebrities he insisted should be sent to the dungeon. <laughs> you know, I was I was laughing when they said that because I just thought, oh my god, I remember trying to draw Ghastly and looking every week to see if if my Ghastly was was in the pages. How funny. I don't remember. I yeah. I I just remember. I remember thinking at the time that of Ghastly actually being a real creature, um, as, as you do. Why would you not? You know, you believe everything when you're a kid. So 
<laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, I don't think I ever wrote about the celebrity side of it, but um, I remember definitely entering the competitions and uh, and trying to draw him quite often. Yeah, I thought I thought the iconography uh, of of Garcia, and I still do. I just thought that was just fantastic the way he looks, and you know, just this, the the sparkle of the eyes that you could just see under the, the cloak. Amazing, just as I say, vivid that sticks with you for uh, stuck with me for forty years. You know, because uh -huh. I'm, I'm guessing uh, that that I, d I don't know where the because again, uh, images of Gasly were already drawn and and, and uh, it, available to us before I actually came along. But I'm guessing it was to do with that public information film about uh, avoiding um, well, um, water and things. Uh, there was one. I did, Again, really quite spooky for its time. Yeah. Uh, but the, I, I'm guessing that, you know, there was a large element of that because it was, again, great mystery to it because it's only the cowl that you see and, uh, and its shape. But I'm, I'm assuming that that's where the, the, the sort of image thoughts were of, of, of what Gashley should, should be most uh, appear as, he, as his first, uh, first incarnation. And then eventually one day, <laughs> We'll peel back the cowl and we'll see what he really looks like. But of course, we never got that far. I always loved the fact that you didn't get to see him. I think it would have spoiled it, really. But um, or that you know, that, but also I love the fact now as a a bit more of a connoisseur of this kind of stuff and being able to go back into the EC comics and things back in the day. I I actually think that um, Ghastly stand still stands up as probably the best one because I don't think the other ones necessarily are as as creepy or as well realized and i think there's the fact that you can't see ghastly is is what's but also like you say the fact that it the interaction with the the reader and the way that that manifests itself is um is something kind of special that i think the other comics had tried to do perhaps in the 50s and 60s and maybe hadn't been quite so, as successful um so yeah the the it's it's funny that what came before and what has come after hasn't, I don't think has ever really hit quite as hard as Ghastly did, but maybe I'm biased. Well, I mean, as, as somebody who works in magazine uh, publishing, you, you'll know this, that, that audience engagement is kind of one of the metrics that shows you're doing well. You know, if, if your audience are in, engaging with you on, on, on such a high level, you go, you know, great, fantastic. You know, how, how do we can, how do we continue this? Um, the um uh i mean all of the fictional editors uh i i, I think are fantastic but you're right it, there's something about ghastly mm -hmm. which is just and i'd i'd not made the connection to the to the public information film at all but it it it's, it's interesting that that um just in recent years there has been a return as the 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 generations of the 70s and 80s of of um uh, sadly got older uh do include myself in that. Um, <laughs> um, that we're revisiting this stuff, and 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 you know, there's several projects like like Scared to Death. Um, uh, um, oh, forgotten the name of it now. Um, the the fake um, public information posters, Richard Littler, um, Scarfolk. There we go. Um, that kind of revisits the horror. The seventies seem to be a. a, a um, in particular, it seemed to be a decade that there was trying to scare the absolute crap out of children. <laughs> you know, and, and it worked. Oh yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting that you had as as Dan's already mentioned, Misty and Spellbound, which were the the the, the comics that were aimed at girls um, in the nineteen seventies, and it wasn't until the nineteen eighties that you get something something like Scream. It, 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 do, do you think? that suggests something about attitudes towards boys and girls comics that um, perhaps boys comics are treated with a little bit more um, well were treated with a little bit more kind of importance for want of a better phrase important or oh, I'm not sure about importance um, it's um, so, I, I guess subject matter isn't it, it, it mm -hmm. I think the, the, what we would call the boys adventure is all uh, to do with supposed action and or for the want of a better word, violence. And there's a fair bit going on. It's a it's a light, much more lively. Maybe girls girls' titles are supposed to be a little more uh, studious, a little more character driven, perhaps, and and, and less um, um, less overtly 
uh, physical in, in, in that, if for the want of a better phrase. Uh, uh, discuss. I, I, I really, I really don't know. <laughs> Simon, what's what's what, what? As somebody who who uh, and we'll we'll come on to this um, had to censor effectively one of the strips that was uh, uh, in 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 screen. What's what's your view on that? Well, I mean, I think Misty is more the sort of gothic horror. You know, it was channeling that you know Wuthering Heights type sort of Misty Moors kind of horror i think you know that's that's always how i remember the misty strips a little more but i think scream when you look at scream it's it's very much of the now you know a lot of those of or of the then you know a lot of the ipc comics always felt like they were a couple of decades in tone slightly behind when they were being published so lion and so forth they always felt like they came out of a slightly earlier era but scream was was set very much in the 1980s it, it just felt like it was a modern comic and mo in, and it didn't need those sort of gothic horror trappings so even dracula file is set right in the here and now and involves you know the, the a russian you know investigator coming up you know it just felt very topical and of the, of the now and i think that's what lifted scream out of some of the other titles less that it was a boys title more that it was just a bit more earthy and of the now i suppose you know the in tone mm. you know all the strips i think i don't think we really went historical with any of them you know they were all modern set horror stories and i think that was really good and you know like ian says we had the 13th floor which was the more futuristic horror so you know i, I just think it the tone of it set it apart anyway from other you know creepy comic characters that there'd been you know we have the likes of cursita doom and you know there were there were mystical characters in comics there was spellbinder i think in lion or one of those but this this felt just you know these are real set stories in the world you recognize and i think that's why the stories packed a little more of a punch it's it's some of the Pat Mills talks about particularly as regards um, Ginty and Misty about the 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 uh, working class stories and and um, trying to make them uh, make stories less as you say of a previous age when everything was stiff upper lip and kind of gung ho and everything. Um, and you look at Scream and Maxwell Towers is tower blocks of which there were many 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 by the by the by 1984 peppering the um uh, the skyline um as, as you say you know uh, a dracula file somehow merged like a bella lugosi style dracula with the cold war which yes. i think is 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 an incredible <laughs> achievement but D darren i mean you you mentioned that you came from a from from an raf family was that something that appealed to you as well the the kind of um the, the, the contemporary nature of some of the stories now that they say that, I actually kind of realised, yes, of course, the comics I was reading before before then were all, yeah, way behind their time. And it did, it, now that makes complete sense, of course, that it was very, apart from as well being something quite new, I think, because obviously as a kid, I didn't know about the comics in, in America in the 50s and 60s and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was just thinking the other day, I can't quite believe that my parents let me read it. I, I, <laughs> when I realized how young I was, because I, I, yeah, I just didn't, I didn't think about the fact that, it, you know, because when you say it's 40 years, you go, oh, how could it possibly be? It only came out 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm quite surprised actually that, um, that my parents just let me, just let me read that. You know, they obviously thought, well, that's fine. But obviously I, I just absorbed all that kind of stuff, any kind of, I mean, I was very young into horror and sci-fi anyway so and the fantastical um so and i had two you know, i have <laughs> killing them off before their time i have two younger brothers so we all into the same kind of stuff so i don't know it's funny because you mentioned the, the the um the video nasties thing and i remember that at the time and uh you'd think that my parents would have been a bit more sort of oh actually maybe uh maybe not maybe this isn't right but they obviously didn't mind us running around with vampire teeth and <laughs> I mean you're very lucky. I had an argument with my dad about issue number one of the real Ghostbusters comic. 
Oh, come on. I know, I know. It's a, a religious household. What can I say? What can I say? Um, but yeah, it, it, the, the one thing I, I, I did want to talk to um, Ian and, and Simon about, it, the sheer breadth of artistic talent you have you had in in screen so you know in the first issue you've you've got alan moore writing monster you've got john wagner and alan grant you know and then you, you know you've got tom tully jerry finley day uh all these guys um artists eric bradbury from the off wonderful amazing jose ortiz um cam kennedy steve parker steve dylan mike dory jesus redondo i mean this it it I, I, you know, looking through that book, I'm amazed at, 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 at the 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 quality of the work that that it was attracting. Was was this something that um, you were very uh, big on editorially, or or were you fortunate in that you know these were the guys who were already working for IPC on on lots of other stuff, so it was relatively easy to to bring them on board. I, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, it. it... Yes, there were all those. Uh, most of those artists were, were uh, already connected with with IPC, so we, we had resource to go to them. But there were others that we, we at the same time that we wanted to use those. There were others that we wanted to sort of bring along. So some of the newer ones that obviously Steve Dillon was one, um, Brett Ewan's uh, another, Brendan McCarthy was another. We, we were trying to pull in at the same time. Um, on, on terms of artists, in terms of writers, it was a little bit more tricky in that trying to get that right pitch for, for Scream. Sorry, <laughs> shouldn't have said that, should like pitch Scream. Um, but it, it, was, it was always difficult to, 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 to hit the, the right notes. And frequently we'd get good writers who, who, we, who we wanted to use but couldn't get, get the right sort of uh, storyline for them or the right material or it, w- it would not fit properly. Uh, others we would we you know we'd, we'd come across and, and hopefully try and pull in i think it was kev sutherland was was kept i seem to remember kev, he kept sending scripts in and, and um uh we were not it was never quite right never quite right. and i think we finally got one from him that we were going to use and uh it was slated for about issue 17 or 18 and of course it never, never saw the light of day <laughs> so it, it was a bit like that we we had a lot of research. Obviously, we we had a. I, I, I personally had a lot of help from um, Robin Smith and, and uh, Steve McManus on two thousand, who were also uh, suggest names for me to to try and, and see what they could come up with. Um, um, but I, yeah, so so yes, we there was those that were existing and, and read already you being uh, available to us at IPC, and then others that we were trying to bring along. Mike Mike Collins was another we were trying to pull Mike Collins in. He, he was just really starting at that point. wasn't wasn't quite always. You know, you know it, it's all an education process, isn't it? And he, he was a little bit early for him to, to actually get involved with anything we were doing, but uh, eventually, of course, he did, he's done lots of nice stuff ever since. So yeah, it, it was to try and use what was existing and to try and find new stuff as well at the same time. I guess. I want to move on to talk about something that's been kind of alluded to all the way through our conversation is is the issue of um censorship and the difficulties that the um uh, editorial encountered in in trying to put screen out um i know barry tomlinson has has talked about this on his on his twitter and and also in the the in one of the introductions um to the book um for those who are listening who don't who, who don't know um, 1976 um, action, uh, which is an IPT title, incredibly controversial. Mary Whitehouse, uh, the, the 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 moral crusader, self-appointed moral crusader, um, uh, was kicking off about the violence in that. To be fair, action is, was incredibly violent, and it's still shocking to me that it was published. However, um, uh, so and um, uh, um, um, John Sanders. Uh, got uh, got dragged on to uh, the the um, was it nationwide with Frank Boff and publicly berated and told that he had no moral character at all and and uh, for publishing this comic. So um, I guess IPC very sensitive to um, uh, to, to, to to criticism. 
but it, it it sounds very much from from uh, what's in the introductions from Barry and yourself, Ian, that that with Scream, the 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 concern, the fear was kind of baked into IPC from from e- even before issue one. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about how that how that fear manifested itself on the day to day? Um, yeah, it, I, I kind of uh, yes, that that I, it was it was um, kind of explained to me when 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 I first got the job, I'd, I'd been working with Dave Hunt on on Eagle, and and he took me for uh, uh, a little celebratory lunch, and he said, "Well done, you know, good work, you got this title." It would be difficult though, uh, and um, and I wasn't fully aware of what, what he was uh, fully implying to me, and he was dead right. <laughs> it was very difficult. Because he was aware that, that, that we were stepping into areas that were that were going to be controversial, and um, some people were going to complain. And what would what would be the backup from from the IPC board? Uh, in terms of when we got the, what got launched, got the title, and we got to issue two, uh, the word came down that we had to pull Terror of the Cats. Um, and I I am assuming I was I was not fully told, but I'm assuming that uh, there was a, a complaint fairly high up. Because Terror of the Cats had been in the dummy, as, as I was saying earlier, and so it had been approved up until this point by quite a few levels of management. But suddenly, after two issues, we were told, no, get that out of there. <laughs> End it now as quick as you can. What, what, and was, what, was, what was so bad about Terror of the Cats? I, I'm, I'm, I can only assume that you know there, there are those people who love cats and any implication that of any trouble... Uh, even if when the cats are misbehaving, any implication of that is 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 is, is, <laughs> is going to cause a problem. And um, and um, you know we saw what what happened to uh, to the West Ham footballers, didn't we? When quite rightly he got he got hold of the calls for what he was doing with the cats. Quite, quite absolutely rightly. Um, so it, so yeah, I'm, I, one assumes that some somewhere along the line, some very high up people said that's got to go and get it out immediately, and that. Led to obviously all kinds of problems for us in, in the editorial to try and sort out how to finish it in some kind of coherent form, um, uh, which Simon very very ably did in, in very quick order. Um, uh, but what that meant was instantly we were being looked at for absolutely everything, uh, and and that's when it got to really really difficult stages of uh, almost every page was being looked at. Uh, not just above us and not just above Barry and not just above Gil, the four and five levels of, of involvement of people looking at it to, to try to get approvals on it. And that was where a lot of the issues of lateness came in because we were making corrections and then they'd go on further up the line and then those corrections would come back and then we'd get them, we'd go back to the original and those corrections would be corrected. And uh, it, you know, quite, quite a, a, a vicious circle to try and get things to move forward. So at that point, because of because of, I, it felt to me because of the, what happened with um, Terror of the Cats, we were under scrutiny to a, to an even greater extent than we thought was going to be possible. And in, as, as it happens, as as the what well, industrial dispute came along, it, it was impossible in the end. We we were one of the first titles that was going to uh, disappear from the um, from the newsstands during the industrial dispute, and and indeed we did disappear. Never to return. It's it's so strange though, because because reading through the book, there's there's no real nasty gore. You know, it's not as <laughs> if this is like the old EC comics that were that were um uh well persecuted in the um in the 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 nineteen sixties, about fifties and sixties um uh, in America. Uh, uh, Simon, because you, you Chris Lauder, who was the 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 the, the writer on um, Terror of the Cats, he walked away from this. Trip. Possibly quite rightly, um, but uh, you, you you were asked to, to bring things to a to, to a close on that. Tell us a little bit about you know your 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 thoughts on what happened. Sure, yeah, I mean my own take on Terror of the Cats and why I think management didn't like it was it was the most in your home of all the stories. You know, the fact that your average moggy might suddenly maul you in the middle of the night. I could see how they might think even if they didn't get many complaints, they might. But, I mean, you know, it, to me, it was one of the, and I hate to say this considering I wrote it, the, one of the weaker stories in that lineup. So, you know, when it came down that we were going to, you know, 
wrap it up i mean i was delighted to have the what you know the script work i'd started my library of death story the werewolf one at this point and that was the first thing i'd written and you know i, I was a very un unschooled writer at that point you know other than looking at other people's scripts and so suddenly to be given this and it's like I think we worked out that, yeah, wrap it up in four more parts and get it out of the way as soon as possible. You just think, oh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do here. But, you know, I think you know, like with a lot of Scream, you draw on all these archetypes. And I thought, well, you know, I always used to love those 50s sci fi movies where there's a giant brain in a tank or something <laughs> or, you know, just let's just make it mad science. Let's take it out of the you know supernatural horror thing and and yeah you know it just it, it was an interesting job but in a way it kind of defined my writing on screen which was often sort of pinch hitting for deadlines you know so terror of the cats was very much you know we need to wrap this up so it's like okay quick type thing oh we need a fill in on dracula file quick type it. <laughs> you know so that was kind of how it went with scream but on the plus side of that it kind of taught me how to write at a pace and on a on and to a schedule you know sometimes these things were overnight i remember i think the issue 8 or 9 has a fill in dracula file that i did and it was literally written overnight you know, so I went home from the full time job at Scream, sat up till whenever writing this episode of the Dracula file and delivered it the next morning on going back into the office. So, you know, that was it, I, you know, and I think that stood me in good stead for writing ever after that, that I could just punch through things and not, you know, get too hung up over it. I mean, it sounds like magazine uh, uh, publishing has not changed at all in uh, in forty odd years. To be quite frank, if I if if, if uh, I know anything, um, we it, I guess this this nicely brings us on to, to 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 what Ian was talking about earlier about the 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 attempt to inject humour into the comic to kind of leaven the bread uh, the, the horror bread a, a, a little bit because there, there 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 are like little humour stories in there, um, but they really stick out like a sore thumb it's 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 quite remarkable i mean I, I, darren's nodding his head away i mean if, if you recognize that as a kid then it's funny. <laughs> i mean it was sad we got saddled with a reprint humor strip as well yeah, right you know i mean if if we could have had one that was a little more screen themed even if it was still presented as a younger reader's comedy strip it would have been so much better but you know fiends and neighbors was just it, it looked like it had come out of an older comic and and that would that was what we were saddled with unfortunately yeah yeah we we, we both had simon and i and i think barry as well we resisted it as much as we could but we were told it, it had to be there um and I know Barry was particularly upset about it because he he hated the idea of having something that was a reprint in in what is a new new comic. Uh, I always know that that's that stuck really badly with him. But it was it came from on high, and we was we were just minions, and we were told to get on with it, and that was that. You know, the funny thing was we we tried to inject humor into the other strips anyway. You know, the that first Dracula file I did. You know, he has to because his coffin hasn't turned up he has to sleep in a bath <laughs> full of earth and things like that and and often those little one pages those ghastly tales were were mostly played for a, a humorous punchline because they were just one page so you know the the funny thing is i think it could have quite happily lived without fiends and neighbors but there you go yeah. I mean, even even something like um uh, um the 13th floor there's humour in that, but, oh, it, yeah. but 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 it's John Wagner and Alan Grant humour, which is probably the probably the problem there because it's <laughs> funny, but it really shouldn't be funny because someone's <laughs> being tortured to death. <laughs> yeah, there, and also there's occasionally uh, elements of just the way Terry spoke and some of Terry's utterances, Uncle Terry. That mm. some of his things were really quite funny, but <laughs> just because of the, the nature of, of what he is, but. Um, yeah, and also there was that, that that little bit that we put on the on the cover that I, I 
quite enjoyed them. We had the all the, the prices were for sale abroad in Australia and Malaysia, and, and we did the Transylvania two marks bit. <laughs> the, the, just little elements like that. We we would always try and slip things like that in uh, wherever we could. But, um, but I sometimes think successfully, is, sometimes not. I think this is turning into a Proustian experience for 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 Darren. It's kind of every single thing he's kind of nodding away, going, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that." <laughs> I feel like I've won a competition. This is brilliant. <laughs> I love this. And it's funny, all the little, the little things that you're talking about that you, you, you drop in. Like, in fact, we even we stole one of the little the, the hits from the cover and put it on our Halloween issue a couple of years back. And that was direct. It, I, I said to my, the, um, my, our art director, um, I was like, it needs to be replicated exactly like this. It has to look like, because people will get it. Um, and it's it, the same as the little nods there that you do with the Transylvanian marks and stuff like that. I love it. Yeah, it's see these things. They they travel on. They they have a yeah. life. They keep, they keep going. I, I, what's the appeal of horror to kids? Because you know, the, the, uh, my 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 nephews uh, growing up were, were were into like you know the the kind of silly what do you call it? silly chili kind of books. You know where it's 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 about zombies and 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 Frankenstein and, and everything. But it. it is I, I, Darren? What 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 was what what was your experience? Why why did horror appeal to you so much? Why was Scream such a formative experience? I don't know. There's probably studies to be done on that. I think it was I think it was the the otherworldliness of it all. I think that's what also why I've always been in, into into sci-fi so much is that it's a complete removal from real life, um, and possibly possibly because of being an RAF kid we didn't have much um, normality. It was all, we were always on the move and stuff like that. So this was, this was able to take you completely out of it. And it's interesting they are talking about Misty earlier on and how um, that was very much about working class kids and their experiences. Whereas this was a completely other out there genre. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. There's something, I think there's something to be said about the, the not being allowed as well, like, you know, the video nasty situation. I remember watching lots of horror films really, really early when I shouldn't have done. Um, so it's about having something that you can't, you shouldn't be having, do you know, I guess is the thing. Sorry, the dogs are tap dancing across the flat. As it's that noise. <laughs> so I'm not being visited by a poltergeist. But, uh, Simon and Ian, is, is that something that you kind of, we're, we're aware of in the back of your minds that, that that kind of illicitness, that kind of, you know, giving kids something that they wouldn't normally have, have access to. I mean, because it's kind of no different to, to to what Action was doing and to a degree 2000 AD where, you know, a kid couldn't go and see Dirty Harry. They couldn't go and see Rollerball. But for, th um, you know, three pence or six pence or nine pence, they could get the, 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 the next best thing. I, I guess there must, there's definitely something in that. Um, uh, it was never a, 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 in my mind that that's what we were doing, um, or leading leading children away, or, or in, in in that sense. But there's always been that appeal for it. That that was what was in my mind that that I always had. Uh, um, uh, the, the horror stories were always things that intrigued me when I was young. I remember a TV series called I think it's called Mystery and Imagination. Tale I know Tales of Mystery and Imagination is is Alan Poe uh, Edgar Allan Poe, but I think the TV series in the mid '60s to uh, early '70s, I think, was was just mystery and imagination. But I used to love that, and I, and I was ten at, at that, and shouldn't have been watching it. But you couldn't get me away from that TV screen because that was that was something I desperately wanted to watch. Why that is, I, I don't know. Just intrigued by by the the things that you shouldn't uh, normally be allowed to to look at. But ooh, we could we could have a quick quick peek at that maybe um something like that i don't know sam do you have any other thoughts on that i don't know yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the same i mean i used to at a, at a hideously young age used to sneak down and watch hammer horror films like yeah. at home you know kids love to be scared i just think you know there's mm. a reason there's a ghost train at fairs and things you know why it was so fun to watch doctor who because that was often kind of scary you know i remember a doctor who episode where they more or less raise a, a devil out yeah i think it's one of the john pertwee ones and you know they raise the devil up and i thought well this is great and <laughs> 
what what is not to love and i never never understood the ipc management fear i mean i think they were afraid more of the parents than the kids reaction to it because i doubt any book kid was fully traumatized by scream but you know i think they they feared the parents would pick up a copy and start writing letters of complaint it wouldn't have come from the kids you know kids love to be scared it's just a universal truth i think I mean, you know, I, I'm still haunted by uh, Curse of Fenric, um, the, uh, the Sylvester McCoy Doctor Who story. So, you know, uh, yeah. these things do have an impact. Um, but, you know, talking about the censorship and the difficulties and everything, it, it wasn't any of those really that, that, that finished um, Scream Off. It was uh, a, a National Union of Journalists dispute in 1984, which, I mean, as... as uh, as impacts of, of a single event go on an entire industry, this one seemed to um, be something of an earthquake because I, I seem to recall it nearly finished 2000 AD off um, at, 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 at the time. I mean, what what, what was your guys' experience of, of being on the inside? Were, were, were you in the dispute or was this something that was happening kind of downstairs? We were all in it. I mean, we were union members. You know, you had to be a member of the NUJ, really, to work at IPC. So, yeah, we were we were right in it and, you know, we're supportive of it as well. But, you know, I mean, it's noticeable that not many at titles other than Scream actually didn't make it out the other end of the NUJ strike. So you have to come away with the opinion that, Scream's days were numbered, but this was the perfect opportunity to make it not look like censorship. Yeah, I, I fully endorse that, Simon. Yeah, it, it was. Uh, I do remember uh, being in a, a, a particular meeting with with management when they announced that it was going to be six titles. This is right in the in the middle of the dispute. There were going to be six titles that were being stopped instantly. Scream being one. I think practical electronics, are, for some reason, this sticks in my mind as another one, but and I can't remember the others. But the, everybody who those titles were were gone, were never coming back, and uh, everybody who worked on them was sacked, no, no matter what. Um, uh, that's when the industrial obviously the NUJ was not going to stand for that, and that's when the the dispute got much much worse. Uh, but it, it was, it, it seemed to me, it was that, that they were happy to let Scream go at that point because it, it was a way of getting rid of the title and getting rid of the, the issues that they thought were going to be a problem for them uh, further down the line. Uh, or perhaps they were, and we weren't privil privileged to that information. But as far as, as far as I knew, and as far as Simon, and as, as far as I know, as far as Barry knew, um, our sales were fine. It wasn't anything to do with that. Uh, it was just a case of we were so late at the printers because of the issues we were outlining earlier. It was very easy to close our title, and um, so that was it. We were gone. Was, was this a seismic event for uh, a young Darren? I was just going to say, can I ask a question? I mean, what happened? So then, what happened? Why, if IPC were happy to let it go, why do they keep doing summer specials for several years after? I think that was because they had a storehouse of material, you know, they they used up a lot of stuff they had, not just, I think, from Scream. I think they might have had some other horror, creepy stuff that just didn't have a home. And, right. yeah, just you know, op the plan chest got opened and out it came and dumped in a summer special, as far as I know. Yeah, I don't that's I would imagine that that was the case. I mean, it, it was mostly Barry uh, Tomlinson who was involved uh, putting together the summer specials. As far as I'm aware, uh, it would have been inventoried material that that they had uh, that had been paid for. So the, the in terms of costs, uh, you know, they'd already been met uh, along the way. So uh, it's it's a it's a it's a way of using material that you already had online that you'd already paid for. I remember being quite distraught as a child because I didn't understand. I did, obviously didn't know anything about the NUJ. I mean, clearly I'm very, very well versed in all of that now. But uh, as a child, I didn't understand. So I was just going to the shop and and then being told it's not here and then going back the next day going, well, is it here yet? And is it here the next day? And then they kept saying things like, eventually they would say to me, oh, 
um, I think it's been cancelled. And I was like, well, it, I, my brain just couldn't comprehend that that was a thing that happened. Um, and obviously, again, that's something that in this career I've had, I've understood only too well. But uh, yeah, as a child, I was actually quite distraught because I just couldn't, it just didn't make sense that something like that ended, especially as it was still quite new. So did you migrate to Eagle afterwards? I think for a bit. Yeah, I think so. Um, but then it also it opened the, the, do the doors to other things for me. And I started getting into, especially when Secret Wars was reprinted in the UK. And then that just blew everything right wide open for me. Um, and I was starting to get into all of that. And then Dragon's Claws and Death's Head and, and then off it went. So, um, but I noticed there was also the, um, there was a German reprint of Scream. I think I've got most of those, if not all of them now, even though I, don't, I can't read them clearly, but it had, it had a life elsewhere, which I thought was very interesting. But that, again, that's something that you discover as you get older, you know. But um, That's interesting. I, I never knew that. I didn't realise it had been published uh, in, in other countries. And I, I no no inkling of that at all. I'll have to try and find some copies of that. I mean, I know oh, those quality comics, the, you know, the US format ones reprinted a bunch of the stuff, didn't they? Spellbinders yeah. and and other ones so yeah yeah i mean it did have a life after after death didn't it <laughs> I, Fitting it, yes. I mean com, com, commonwealth syndication and foreign syndication was huge business for ipc so we, we you know we we keep finding like the spider in urdu um <laughs> and you know just uh, how it got there no idea but it would have run for years because there was so much material um absolutely fascinating um i want to just um to, to to well to wrap things up but also um to 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 dwell on what could have been because um uh, it i think it's something that, that you refer to in in your introduction to to the collected edition was um being contacted by screaming lord such Oh, yes. of the monster raving loony party for a possible collaboration <laughs> Yes, I know. That was that was just one day. Phone rings, pick it up. Hello, it's Screaming Lord Such here. Do you know me? And and oddly, strangely, I did remember him from the, from the sixties and things. Uh, and he's somehow or other thinking because of the screaming, scream, screaming, just the connection of the two, uh, to the the two words that there, there could be some kind of collaboration in the future. I have no idea what that would have looked like, um, but. It was one of those, oh, right. And so I told Barry about it and, and I thought, well, we'll leave it, shall we? For, for the time <laughs> being, we'll put that to, to one side. <laughs> one, one of the great what-ifs of comics history. <laughs> it it uh, must have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I, said, I, I want to talk about the, the, the legacy of screen. Because like 15 issues. It only lasted a few months in, in 1984, but it's clearly had a, 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 a big impact. And not not least uh, um i i feel by you know bringing uh, you two together ian and simon together um because of course you went on to to work on uh, marvel uk's transformers comic uh, together to, for yeah. which i thank you very much indeed because that was my first comic um and uh, here, here i now sit so uh, my <laughs> parents thank you very much indeed for uh, eventually giving me a job um <laughs> But, but what, what do you think is the legacy of of of, of Scream and the attempts to do, you know, uh, not just a, a, a horror title, but a kind the kind of title that that still tied everything together, that, that you know, was still from that age when anthology comics on the British newsstand were, were, were still king? Ooh, <laughs> I don't I don't know. It's it, it's kind of it's kind of a strange one. Um it, 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 there's one of those th it's, it's a timing thing I think it, it, is, 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 a, is a possibility to it, it in the sense that it, Scream benefited from being on kind of newsprint and being black and white and being sort of rough, rough around the edges uh, and strangely enough we, we, as Simon and I moved forward we, we benefited from the change in that when things became glossy and, and sleek and shiny and we were strangely we, we produced a robot title for, to fit in with that in in transformers and I, I don't know whether there's, a, there's an element of because scream was more or less the last title of that ilk 
of that time and then everything moved across to being into the glossier shinier full color um, uh, world whether that is a, is an element of why people fondly remember it uh, because it was sort of the last of, of of, of, along that line, if if you like, I mean, even two thousand subsequently mo moves across into being full color and, and, and glossy and what have you. So it, it, it's almost like it was the last in the in the line of, of traditional comics at, at that point. I, I don't know if others have got any view about whether that was something to do with with why it it, 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 it people held it in in you know it held it in their minds because it, it everything sort not everything but. An awful lot of things changed in the nature of comic production after, after screen. I mean, I, I think there's there's that and there's the fact that it was only 15 issues. Strange mm. keeps it in that bubble of it was it it was, you know, in some ways it's like a little perfect jewel. You know, it never got a chance to get stale or old or repetitive or run out of ideas or not move with the times. So it's, it exists in its perfect bubble of those 15 issues and what might have been. And I, I think, you know, sometimes when you do that, it, it preserves it in people's minds a lot more than something that chuntered on to the point where you got bored with it and put it away. So I, I think that's possibly part of the appeal. And I think, you know, because it exists in that era of 2000 AD, and finally comics creators getting credit boxes and and so forth, it kind of feels very modern, the comic as well. It feels like it fits into that era where people were starting to understand who creators were, who the artists were, who, you know, and move with those artists and writers onto other things. So it was a sort of perfect launch pad at the perfect time, I think. And, you know, for me personally, it was the greatest bit of training you could have asked for in that short period of time, just about how to put a comic together, how to write comic stories, how to engage with readers. So, you know, that rolled on into Transformers. And really, you know, it, I built my career on the back of Scream, without a doubt. Amazing. Uh, uh, Darren, I'll come to you for, for, for a final word. I mean, we've kind of dwelt on the the, <laughs> the legacy for you of, of something like Scream. But is, is, it, what, what, what's the highlight? What's, what's the thing that, what's the moment, the Scream moment that kind of sticks in the mind most for you? I just, just think it was the comic that dared. I just felt like it, it shifted something. And, I, and listening to Simon and, and Ian talk about the little bits of things that happened, and specifically there about the fact that you you were seeing who was the creator and you were following their work. I think that's such a key thing. It's so important because there's so many things. For, because obviously me seeing that, I then I just, in my, in my head, I think that's how it always ha has been. But realizing now, obviously, as I've grown up, that wasn't always the case before. And it very much was the case for me that I would follow people and their work and I know their art and I recognize art immediately as and knowing who that artist is, is so important. Um, and that's because of things like this, like you get into it, you know who the writer was, you know who the, um, the, the artist is, if not necessarily what the editor looks like really. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I, this this has been a fantastic uh, discussion. We've we've clearly made Darren's day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we <really> have. <laughs> I love it. It's fascinating to me. Just Wonderful. magazines and comics in general, but also this particular comic. Just so incredible. That book is gorgeous. Mm, no, absolutely. Uh, it, it and it's it's nice to be able to. Do, I mean, it helps that it was only fifteen issues, so we can. You know, people often ask, "Are you going to do like archive copies of 2000 AD?" It was like, "Can you can you imagine the site?" Like, I've <laughs> I've I've seen floors of houses bowing under the weight of the comics. Never mind, like a a glossy reprint with a hardcover. Like, madness, you could madness. do the summer specials next. <laughs> <laughs> I I shall pass it on to uh, to our own uh, a, a team of fictional editors. That way, um, <laughs> but it, it 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 does it does feel like for only fifteen issues, Scream had a, 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 a an impact far greater than um, than its longevity um, would suggest, and uh, perhaps a a little bit of the kind of 
slightly ignored history. 2000 AD kind of, you know, I'm guilty of this as much as anyone, it kind of shines so brightly in that period that it's kind of easy mm -hmm. to forget just mm -hmm. how much um, creativity and, and, and how many comics were, were happening at the time. Um, but I'll stop rambling now. Uh, and thank you all three for being a part of this. Is, this has been absolutely wonderful, wonderful discussion. Uh, so special to share these memories with you. And um, yeah, the uh, 40 years of, of screen book is um, uh, available and uh, probably heavy enough to kill a person with. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, There's a story in that. I oh yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. A fitting conclusion. <laughs>